artwork, check out the Washington Journal mugs and see all of the C-SPAN products. Washington Journal continues. Gordon Gray at our table, Fiscal Policy Director with the American Action Forum. What is your group? So we're a center-right, market-oriented think tank. Um, and my portfolio there is the economy, the tax and budget. So right now I don't have a particularly good story or to tell or a lot of great news, unfortunately. Well, do you think that um, we're headed toward a recession? And if so, what are the indicators in your opinion? So I think right now we're, we're actually headed for some, some choppy waters. The yield curve inversion of this week is a troubling sign. There are some reasons to think that we shouldn't overvalue the signal that the yield curve inversion sent this week, but it's still a troubling sign in my view. There are policy risks out there. Certainly the trade war is having an effect, a detrimental effect on the economy. That's a significant risk to the economy. Um, but we have other data coming in, particularly this week, strong retail sales. <clears throat> that suggests that the fundamentals of the economy are sound and we don't have a risk of a recession in the immediate offing. But some of the signs we've been getting lately are troubling. For those that don't know what a yield curve sure, is, including yeah. myself, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> explain. Course. Absolutely. Yeah, let me take a step back and, and sort of walk through that. The yield curve is a graph or a plot of interest rates for government bonds over increasingly long maturities. Maturities is just how long the duration of that borrowing is. So we're familiar with concepts like 10-year treasury bonds. Essentially, that's the government borrowing money from the public for the period of 10 years. Now, traditionally, and this makes sense, that if you give somebody uh, money or loan money to somebody for a longer period of time, you're gonna expect higher interest back. Um, that's kind of a fundamental understanding of a, of a healthy economy. And the yield curve usually reflects that, that the longer the term, then the higher the interest rate. What happened this week is that long-term interest rates declined relative to shorter-term interest rates. And that's historically been a signal that investors and sort of forward-looking observers are expecting uh, troubled economic waters ahead. Paul Krugman writes in his a piece in the New York Times today, from Trump boom to Trump gloom is the headline. Uh, and this is what he writes, that la you may recall that last year after a couple quarters of good economic news, Trump officials were boasting that the 2017 tax cuts had laid the foundation for many years of high economic growth. Since then, however, the data have pretty much confirmed what critics had been saying all along. Yes, the tax cut gave the economy a boost, a sugar high. Running trillion dollar deficits will do that. But the boost was temporary. In particular, the promised boom in business investment never materialized. And now the economy has reverted at best to its pre-stimulus growth rate. Agree, disagree? So in, in this instance, I would agree with some elements of what uh, um, Dr. Krugman said, but I would have to disagree with some others. So first of all, yeah, the, the, the tax cuts and the, the spending deals that we've seen did, in fact, have a stimulative effect over the, sh the short term. It certainly increased the deficit. Tax cuts don't pay for themselves. However, there are other elements of the, of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that were more a function of tax reform. And I think that those still hold promise. It is not the case that we can take a step back and say that those aren't working. Because to do that, you have to do a causal analysis. You have to look at all the data, strip out all the other noise in the data to identify what the effect of the tax cut was. Nobody's really done that yet. Meanwhile, you have the president's trade war that is basically taking the very channel, business investment, that the tax cut was supposed to incentivize and stimulate. The trade war is having a directly counteractive effect. It is basically taking that uh, that very channel and smacking it right in the face. So it's really difficult to disentangle those two. Is it possible that the president's strategy is a long game and that in the end, things could get better? So I think that that's the, the right way to evaluate how the president is approaching the, tr the trade war. Is there a benefit for all the costs? Now, the administration has been trying to tell the American people that we're not actually seeing costs. And... I would have to disagree with the administration's story there. However, if there's a cost, then we also have to 
assess what the benefit is, and maybe the, the trade policies passes the cost-benefit test. Unfortunately, I'm not convinced that the administration's strategy is one that would realize all the changes we're expecting the Chinese to make. So far, I'm unconvinced that the pain that the uh, U.S. economy is sort of taking on is worth what the trade, the trade negotiations will produce. We want to open up the conversation to our viewers. We're talking about the health of the U.S. economy. What is it like where you live? Republicans, 202-748-8001. Democrats, 202-748-8000. And independents, 202-748-8003. The president tweeting out yesterday this. The United States is now by far the biggest, strongest, and most powerful economy in the world. It is not even close. As others falter, we will only get stronger. Consumers are in the best shape ever. Plenty of cash. Business optimism is at an all-time high. How do we compare to other countries, and what is happening in uh, other countries' um, e economies, with Germany, right. Argentina, et cetera, and what impact will, could they have on others? Right. So we're in an increasingly interconnected global economy. That's why the president's trade policies are so troubling, both uh, to the real economy and also for financial markets. So the slowing of growth in, uh, in the rest of the world has a real effect on the U.S. economy. So I'm really troubled by the, the global growth environment. And I think that's also animating some of what the Federal Reserve is doing. So what is happening in Germany specifically? And is it, is it part of uh, or related to the president's trade policies here with China, et cetera? So we are seeing a, a, a number of economies a number of our trading partners downgrade their, their growth estimates. We are seeing, I think, global disruptions in all of our trading arrangements. So it's, it's not just Germany. Uh, there's Argentina, there's Singapore. There's a number of our trading partners that are, um, I think, flashing some warning signs for the global economy. And it's, it's troubling. And I think it's also animating, to some extent, the, the yield curve inversion that we saw this week. So it does have an impact on this economy, the I, United States. I believe so, yeah. And that's, that's why some of the signals we're getting th this week are troubling. Brad is in International Falls, Minnesota, Republican. Brad, we're talking about the health of the U.S. economy. How would you rate it? Well, I think it's, it's doing okay. Um, but I, I got a real problem with people, you know, just thinking that, it, I mean, the, your guess is just giving you an opinion. That's his opinion, which is like Krugman's worthless to me in a lot of cases. But when I see that China's stealing the intellectual properties and then nobody stood up for the American people, and now Trump is doing it, now you got all these bad mouth people just cracking off the way that they've been. What are they expecting? that Trump shouldn't stand up for these people? I mean, come on. I mean, so um, so this, this, this nonsense of bashing Trump has to end. I mean, it really does. So, okay, so Brad, we'll take your point then for Gordon Gray about the president sticking up for the American people when it comes to intellectual property and currency manipulation as right. well. So, so I, I think the, um, Brad makes a, a, a good point about China being a, a bad actor in, the, in global trading. The United States, and, and Brad is correct on this, um, needs to take a firmer stance with respect to China's approach to intellectual property and a number of their other uh, actions around the world. They're um, militarizing the South China Sea. They are, they're a, a bad actor. Um, However, it is not clear that the strategy that the president, that the executive branch is embarking upon, would actually achieve the goals that they're saying needs to be achieved. And it's not obvious that the cost that the, that the executive branch is taking on is worth it, that it will actually help achieve those goals. We would strengthen our hand if we were to approach China in a multilateral fashion, bring on our allies. Instead, the president is threatening a lot of our other trading partners with tariffs. And I think that actually weakens our hand as it relates to China. We'll go to Mitchell, Indiana. Eddie, a Democrat caller, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I don't have any problems with the tariff that the president is putting on everybody. I've watched all the news channels. They all say that everybody else is hurting more than us. And honestly, the, after the recession hit, the small communities no matter probably where you're at, but especially in Indiana, have never recovered. And uh, I, I, I said I don't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, uh, the price of gas 
Aline in, in this community went down 18 cents yesterday. So, sir and ma'am, I see nothing but positive out of, out of all of this. And uh, thank you for taking my call. Okay, Eddie. So, Gordon Gray, what about his analysis? Thanks, Eddie. And and I think he uh, he he's identifying what I think a lot of Americans have experienced, which is we we coming off of the worst recession in a generation in many generations. A lot of communities have not fully recovered. We are now celebrating the longest expansion in, in U.S. history, but it hasn't delivered the wage growth, it hasn't delivered the prosperity that I think a lot of us wanted to see. Meanwhile, we have, have China that is, I think, violating global trade norms and is, like I said earlier, is a bad actor in the trade space, and now you have a president who is taking them on, and vocally, uh, and I, I think that that is, for, for communities who have been, been harmed, they can see that as someone who's sticking up for them. However, I would just have to say, the president's approach to China should be evaluated on what it actually achieves, not what we're saying along the way. And what has it achieved so far? So far, I'm, we, we haven't seen a change in China's behavior in, in general. So far, we haven't secured uh, a trade agreement with China. So right now, we're taking on a lot of the costs with no obvious benefit. And are other countries hurting more than the United States, as that caller said? So I think with respect to China, we're right now on the losing end of that. We have seen China reduce trade barriers with other countries. So as it relates to our trade war with China, other countries are benefiting, not us. Judson, Bedford, New Hampshire, a Republican. Hi, Judson. Oh, good day. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I, I really had some questions regarding looking at the short game versus the long game. Uh, one of the things I understand is that during the Obama eight years, we did have a recovery, in fact, although a very slow recovery, and that what we've had in the last two years has actually been an expansion. And if I recall correctly, uh, a few months ago, it was predicted that we would have $3.4 trillion added on to our, uh, added on to our, our economy, and that's been revised down to $2.5 trillion, and that the, that the significance of the tariffs with China, even if they go to a full 20 percent, would be uh, less than $200 billion. Now, $200 billion sounds like a lot, but when you compare it to the expansion of $2.5 trillion, it's, it's a relatively small figure. So even if we had the full effect of the tariffs, they would have a very small effect on the expansion that we've enjoyed the last two years, number one. Number two, with the devaluation of the yuan, and I don't know the exact percent that it was devalued, but when that happens, that means the Chinese uh, yuan is cheaper to our dollar, our dollar buys more. So part of the effect of the tariffs would be countered by by Chinese goods being even cheaper, uh, so that so it's mit mitigated that way. Also, with the devaluation of the yuan, the uh, capital has been leaving. My understanding, and you can correct me on this, that capital has been leaving China to go to where the, the where money is more stable, and in fact, the only place in the world they can come is the United States. And and I was thinking that that would have the effect of decreasing the ten year. Treasury rates. Okay, so Justin, mm -hmm. ha hang on the line for me. Let's have Mr. Gray respond to you, and we'll come back to you if for any follow-ups. Go ahead. So, great, great question. He he hit on a lot of the the elements and um, dynamics in the global economy. So this is a great question. So first of all, the the U.S. we were expecting something close to three per, uh, percent uh, growth this year. I've seen a number of, of uh, analyses that are showing that the trade war could reduce that by about uh, half of a percentage point of GDP. That's, that's a lot. If we're expected to be growing at 3%, half a percentage point is growth that we need. Right now, the Atlanta Fed is saying that we're probably right now growing at something like 2%. That, that's higher than the trend was uh, over the previous eight years, but it's still not a robust enough trajectory of growth to really change 
the growth outlook and to deliver the kind of improvement in the standard of living that a lot of Americans have come to expect. So th the trade war is having an unfortunate and um, negative effect on GDP growth. With respect to the devaluation in, in uh, the Chinese currency, the, the Chinese did allow their currency to devalue relative to the dollar, but not substantially and not to a degree to fully offset the tariffs. What that's showing is that Chinese exporters are not absorbing the tariffs, and instead those are largely being borne by, uh, by the U.S. economy. Judson, are you there? Any follow-up? Oh, oh, yes. Well, I have follow-up to, to those, but I also have other questions. Um, certainly uh, decreasing the, uh, the growth down to near 2%, uh, you know, that's less than our expectations, but it's better than the 1.5% we were enjoying for years. Sure. Uh, also, here in New Hampshire, our, our um, manufacturing base uh, since NAFTA decreased 25%, 25% of all manufacturing jobs left New Hampshire. Uh, and in the last two years, we've had an expansion that all the employers I know say that they're, they've hired 30 to 50% more people than they had uh, 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 two, three years ago. Uh, and I'm not, my wife does a lot of shopping. We do a fair amount of shopping. We know a lot of people, have a lot of contacts, and nobody I know has said that there's been any effect that they can feel from the tariffs. Uh, also, uh, uh, Mr. Epstein was talking about having partners in these multilateral negotiations. Well, we, we know from, from history that trying to herd countries together is, is worse than trying to herd children or goats. Uh, and, um, in fact, some of the, uh, the people that we would want supposedly on our side, number one, they're not going to agree. Uh, number two, uh, some, uh, India, for example, it has tariffs on some of our products that, that are even 100 percent tariffs. So uh, they, they may not steal intellectual property. They may not uh, uh, you know, undermine and, and, and extract uh, uh, agreements from companies in order to, to, practice, to uh, deal in India. But they do have uh, onerous tariffs on our products. Okay. As a, and, and Judson, um, uh, we've got to run at this point. Gordon Gray, respond. So to be sure, bringing together a multilateral coalition to take on China's bad trading practices is a difficult task. And compared to the difficult task that the president has embarked upon in a trade war, my own view is that it would have a greater chance of success. And that, in my view, is uh, the best approach to to dealing with, with China. The goal is to actually achieve changes in China's policies. China is a fairly stable authoritarian regime. It's very difficult to compel them to change their practices. So it would be my view that we need to marshal as much support in that effort as we can. Okay, let's move on to Lissy in Bloomington, Indiana, Democratic caller. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I agree with everything you just said. Um, I was wondering, the tax break that was given really didn't help a lot of people. And now we have Moscow Mitch working with a Russian aluminum company coming in. And I think that's not a good thing for our country. What happened to the tax break that the big corporations were supposed to build these companies, our American companies? So I don't know. What do you think about that? That's my question. Sure. Th thank you for the call. Um, certainly with respect to the, to the tax cuts, and maybe it would be worthwhile to, to take a step back and just – break out what the different elements of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act were. There's actually three pieces. The first is the individual uh, tax cuts, and that was rate reductions for, for taxpayers. There were some changes to the tax items that people can claim, so credits and exemptions. The second piece was the business tax reform, and so that's the reduction in the corporate tax rate, some changes to an incentivize investment in the United States. And then the third piece were changes to the international tax regime. 
So certainly on the, the, the first part, um, that's the individual tax changes. And an assessment by the Joint Committee on Tax, so that's Congress's tax estimator, did, did show that the largest percentage changes in the, the individual tax cuts did in fact accrue to essentially the middle class. However, certainly a lot of attention has been placed on the business tax piece, and so that was the, the reduction in the corporate tax rate. It's important to remember though that prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the U.S. corporate tax rate was the highest in the world, and we were certainly seeing frequent news stories of U.S. companies wanting to leave the U.S. to go to other countries for tax reasons. I think one of the good things that we've seen in the aftermath of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and, and I think the TCGA is a mixed bag, and I think that the caller, caller's comments ref, reflect that, but one of the good developments in the uh, wake of the enactment of the TCGA is that we're no longer seeing companies fleeing U.S. shores, and that is to, to a large extent, I believe, because of the change in the corporate tax rate. I think that's a, a worthwhile uh, change. The other change was the, in, the incentive to invest in the United States. It's called expensing. That is where we provide tax incentives for business to invest and they can write off that investment immediately. That is supposed to improve investment in the United States, that's supposed to grow productivity, and then that's supposed to translate into wages. Unfortunately, the trade war is running directly counter to that channel. So my concern is that the president's trade policies is basically taking that channel of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and uh, nullifying it. And so that's a real problem. We're talking about the health of the U.S. economy with Gordon Gray, Don in Las Cruces, New Mexico, Independent. Your question or comment? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Trump, li Trump likes to talk about the rise of the stock market value, but let's remember that the stock that the Trump tax cuts, what the corporations, instead of it, it, instead of using that as business development, those corporations mm. did stock buybacks. And the effect of those stock buybacks was to goose the stock, the value of the stock, instead of uh, instead of developing the country, the, the company. And the second thing that the, those corporate buybacks did, did in well, those corporate buybacks, and instead of giving wage increases, they gave bonuses. So, the, so basically, the wages of, of workers didn't improve that much. The second point that I'd like to make is that between 30 and 35 percent of stock is owned by foreign, by foreign investors. Those foreign investors take $44 billion out of our economy every year. So if we're looking at, this, at the stock market, I think it's, you know, it's a sham because it hasn't been built on real development of corporations. Instead, it's been just goosed by the Trump tax cuts. Okay, let's get a response. So Don, great, great question. I'm, I'm glad somebody asked about, about buybacks because there's been a lot of news attention to these. And I, I think there is a little bit of confusion about what the tax cut, particularly on the business side, was supposed to do, how that's supposed to operate, and then how that relates to, to buybacks. So the tax, the business tax cut is designed to incentivize in investment. What it is, what it does is basically improve the outlook for a particular investment. It makes investments more attractive than they otherwise would have been prior to the tax change. If a business then has an incentive to invest, it will then expand, hire, and resource that investment. And that is the, the fundamental um, theory that under, underpins the, the business tax change there. What buybacks are doing is essentially returning old cash to investors. So that is a function of just the cash and past earnings that businesses had on hand. And so it's important to remember that those two dynamics, what cash a business has on hand and what their prospects for future investment are, are completely different elements. So I think it's, it's certainly easy to conflate the two, but in this instance, unfortunately, they're, they're separate elements. David Dennison, Texas, a Republican caller. Good morning to you. Yes, good morning. Um, interesting that you started out this segment or pretty close to it with a, with a piece from Paul Krugman. Um, in my humble opinion, I don't believe there's a group of experts in the country or world that's probably disproved, probably proven wrong more than economists. Go back and look at what he predicted was going to happen with the election of Trump and look what happened with the election of Trump. And Trump 
accurately says, don't judge the success of his policies based on the inauguration date. Go back and look at what happened the next day after the stock markets took their initial drop, listening to Krugman for five seconds, and what they ended up doing the rest of that week and then pretty much following up on to now. The comparisons of our economy now, even at 2 percent, to the Obama 1.5, 1.8 for eight years, while you acknowledge that that's and it's still an improvement. It's not a it's not a fair comparison. During the Obama administration, you had zero interest rates. The Fed was pumping thirty to fifty trillion dollars billion dollars into the into the economy every month for years. Under Trump, we're we're seeing the interest rate go up. In fact, is it, the, many people, <clears throat> financial folks and and so-called experts, said Trump was crazy months ago when he said the Fed should have decreased the rate instead of increased the rate the fourth quarter, and now pretty much everybody seems to agree that Trump made the right call on that. So the the 2% Trump economy right now, to compare that to to what we were doing before, we're really doing even much better, especially when you take into account, as you acknowledged many times, that the stated goals of the Trump economy are offset and, and mitigated by the trade war. But the problem is, if we don't do the trade war now, when? This is probably our last best shot, and as far as having our our so-called allies to work with us, it would probably take us 10 years to get them together to agree to do anything. And the reality is we've got issues with all of them as well because, because the trade deals haven't just been bad with China. They've been bad everywhere. Why would we pay uh, uh, four times uh, the tariff when we send our cars to Europe that we charge them? Why would we let 20 of the 27 – NATO countries pay a fraction of what they're supposed to be paying. I mean, Trump is balancing these things out. We're at a unique situation here from a strength standpoint. $16 trillion in sovereign debt is in a negative interest rate right now overseas. That's one reason money is flowing here. Obviously, we're the less dirty shirt while this is going on. This is war. That's why you have 73 percent of the farmers that were polled this last week who are probably as a group being hurt and targeted the worst by China, still uh, still supporting Trump. And that's 73 percent. The say, say they're supporting Trump. They, he never had 100 percent. So did, did he lose any? I okay. doubt it. All right. So, so, David, let's take his argument. If not now, when would we make these um, changes to try to level the playing field? So, so first, I, I, I share his, his frustration with, and as a practitioner, with economists' ability to predict the future. Um, we certainly get it uh, wrong way more often than we get it right. So I, I, I share that, that frustration. Um, and, and the caller is right. There has been a marked change in the trajectory of the economy since the president took office. That's, that's just the reality. I think some policies that the president has pursued on the regulatory front. I think some elements of the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act were, were very sound. Those clearly have had a positive effect on, on economic growth. Whether or not those are durable or not is another question, and that's certainly something that a lot of us are going to be, be looking at. In terms of what the right approach on the, the trade front is and whether or not we should be doing this now or, or later, I think, again, the question is, if now, then how? And as I've stated before, my own view is that the approach that the administration is taking on trade and with respect to China is not a disciplined one. If you look at how the president has announced his tariffs, the degree to which that president does not seem to have been taking advice from his, his advisors, even in rather uh, sharp elbowed negotiations with the Chinese suggest to me that this is not a deliberate strategy. That's my, that's my concern about the outlook for the, the trade war. Chris Chesterfield, Virginia, Democratic caller. Hey, how are you? Thank you very much. Morning. And I, and I, I, I love that previous caller because I think it's very important to understand that, that, that I, fundamentally speaking, um, I agree with uh, Mr. Gray. Trump's, Trump's not an economic international specialist. I mean, there, there, there are things that people attribute to him that, I'm sorry, he, he just doesn't have. And, and when you look at how he's laid these tariffs out, I, I have three basic questions. One, when did, these, when did these issues with China start? People have been talking about China reverse engineering and having these practices for decades, and yet our corporations still continue to deal with him. When did they uh, deal with China? When did those issues become national issues? In other words, corporations were fine with it. It was, it was a cost of doing business. And then magically, 
Trump gets in, and all of a sudden, oh, well, the, we, we, this, this is a national outrage. And Look, corporations make decisions. And I'm, and I'm not telling you that China is not a bad player. They do all kinds of things, but none of these things are new. And, and if you're, if, if you're going to make a decision as a corporation to continue doing business with China, I, I don't get the correlation as to why all of a sudden my tax dollars and this becomes a, a matter of national security. But, but, but l- let's just give that away. The, the, the previous caller was talking about Trump and how he's, you know, he's, he's made this move and made this move. It's absolutely reckless. Tariffs, like 85% of all economists, when he first initiated this, said bad news, bad news, bad news. Whether they be Republicans, conservatives, liberals, whatever, because people understand the, the global economy that we live in now is never helped by this type of uh, reckless, aggressive, politically driven motivation. You, you, economics is about causal relationships. And I, I'm sorry, but there's nothing about this administration that I've seen that tells me that they stop, think, plan out, and then are executing an economic strategy. I don't see it, but I'm, I wanted to ask your, your guest okay. what he thinks. Okay, Mr. Gray. Uh, Chris, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the, the, the developments we're seeing from China are, are not new. Their hand in the global, uh, in the global economy as a geopolitical actor, as a regional, uh, regional uh, hegemon, if you will, in their militarization of the South China Sea. Uh, that has been on the rise, and that's a function of their strengthening economy. But it's not an, it, we didn't just discover this uh, when Trump was inaugurated. So I, I think your observation there is, is spot on. Um, and I have to agree with you in terms of the, the president's strategy. It's not clear that there is a coherent strategy. That's my real concern is that the undisciplined announcement of tariffs to me suggest that what the president is doing is very much just reflecting a fondness for the ability to unilaterally make changes in policy. With tariffs, the president can essentially, to to a large degree, flip a switch and have an effect. It can affect financial markets, and I think the president has become somewhat enamored of that effect. From If you look at reports about how he's approaching these decisions among his advisors, they don't suggest that this is part of a deliberate strategy. That really concerns me. That also suggests that that cost-benefit test that I was talking about with respect to the trade war, that we're taking a lot of costs, and if there isn't a coherent strategy to achieve the benefits, then it's ultimately not a worthwhile policy uh, pursuit. We'll go down to Austin, Texas. Joe is watching there on our line for Republicans. Yeah, hi. Just a couple comments. Um, you know, I do work for a large company. Um, it has has an effect. You know, a large technology company. So, just the fact to say that this is this has gone on forever doesn't make it right. Um, then, with that, also, I just had a question. Every everybody that comes on to Washington Journal who talks about the tax um, the tax deal has said that it's blown a hole in our deficit. I went online and looked, and our tax revenues are up year to year. And if they continue to be up year to year, how has the tax deal blown a hole in the deficit? Isn't okay. it just a spending problem? Okay, Joe, take that. So great, let me, let me uh, address that question uh, first, which is yeah. the, the deficit effect of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So when people talk about it blowing a hole in the deficit, what they're talking about is compared to what the deficit would have been if we hadn't done the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So tax revenue will naturally grow over time. As as the U.S. population grows, as more workers work, as wages increase over time, a little bit of inflation that we have going on naturally, revenues, all else equal, are on an upward slope. The question is, are they lower than they otherwise would have been in the um, if we hadn't done the, the tax cuts? And that, to me, clearly is yes. The tax cuts that have not paid for themselves. Revenue is, is higher than it was last year, but it is lower than what revenue would have been this year if we hadn't done them. So we are taking on additional debt, and, and we've increased the deficits because of the tax cuts. The question, and I think the question essentially that the, the policy posed is, is it worth the red ink that we're taking on. That's an open question. At this point, it's hard to answer because no one's done the causal analysis to see if, particularly on the business side, if the changes have produced enough growth to make that worthwhile. My own view is they won't pay for themselves, but maybe it's a worthwhile growth proposition. I'm I'm a little skeptical of that 
to be honest, because it was a very expensive tax cut. A lot of the expense in the tax cut was on the individual tax cuts. I don't think there's enough opportunity for growth there to make that cost necessarily worthwhile. It's possible. I'm, I just question that, that assumption. though. All right, Elise in uh, California, Democratic caller. Good morning. I'm uh, really more concerned about the economy in the United States. I live in Southern California, and I see malls closing, and I see homelessness with children and mothers and families, and things are really not good with the economy. So when Trump first started uh, his campaign, he said he was going to bring jobs back, jobs back, jobs back. Well, maybe we should bring our jobs back. Maybe bring our jobs back from China. Okay, well, so let's, at least because we're, we're short on time, our jobs coming back. So what we have not seen is a tremendous amount of jobs coming back from overseas, but we have seen a substantial improvement in the overall unemployment rate in the, in the U.S. economy. Unemployment is near at record lows. So at the most macro level, at the national level, the labor market is, is really strong. However, we've got a couple other things going on that are still problematic. We're still down from the number of workers that would have been working from the, the Great Recession. We've got a problem there. And I think the caller identifies the fact that just because the economy looks great, or at least looks pretty strong, at the national level, there are still communities that have never fully recovered. Gordon Gray, we'll leave it there. Fiscal Policy Director with the American Action Forum. You can go to AmericanActionForum.org to learn more. Thank you very much for the conversation. That does it for today's Washington Journal. Thank you all for watching. We'll be back tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Enjoy your weekend. And updating the story we were talking about er earlier regarding uh, Michigan Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Within the past 24 hours, the Israeli government announced that the Michigan Democrat had been granted a humanitarian visa to visit her grandmother in the West Bank. Congresswoman Tlaib responded this morning and tweeted the following, quote, silencing me and treating me like a criminal is not what she wants for me. It would kill a piece of me. I have decided that visiting my grandmother, grandmother under these oppressive conditions stands against everything I believe in, fighting it against racism, oppression, and injustice. Some scheduled news here coming up tonight on C-SPAN. We'll bring you the Senate Aging Committee, their recent hearing on robocall fraud. Among the witnesses,